everyone, as we get settled here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tim Bladick, and this is my wife, Sue, and we're with Four Seas Orphan Ministry. And uh, following up on the great uh, story, the, the This Is Us, uh, looking at our, our church, we, uh, this is Orphan Sunday, and we realize that, that a relatively uh, new part or, and a major part of us are uh, Mike, Meg, and their family. And uh, so we thought, although Mike has shared a little bit uh, in the past about their family formation, we thought today on Orphan Sunday um, we'd share a little bit more, have them share a little bit more about their adoption stories. And uh, as I shared with the first service, uh, not only have they become a part of us, but in a major way they've actually had to take us into their family as well. And so uh, I guess they truly are Forsey's foster family. They love it. They love it, Tim. You, the people love it. You liked it much better than the first service. But anyway, uh, so Mike and Meg, you've, thanks, first of all, for, for letting us intrude into your privacy a little bit this way. And uh, maybe you could start out by just introducing us to your family again so we, everybody knows who they are. Yep. So on the left there is our oldest son, Clay. On the right, uh, far right, is Karis. Uh, next to her is Michaela. We sometimes refer to them as our three homegrown. And then uh, in the middle there, uh, next to Meg, is Matthias, and next to me is Abram. Those are our two boys from Ethiopia. And then above Meg's shoulder is Fen, and she came home at age 11 from China. Uh, she's now 13, so technically she's the second oldest, but don't even try to figure out all that stuff. So, <laughs> so just starting with the basics, maybe you could just share with us why you uh, chose to adopt. Sure. Um, I think as I became a Christian, as a freshman in college, um, I just, as I was understanding the gospel and reading through God's word, I really started to see the picture that um, adoption um, in this world is of our adoption as God's child. And um, just understanding Ephesians 1, um, where he's talking, you know, we're, it's talking about us being adopted as God's children. I really started feeling like God was calling me personally um, to paint that picture for the world through adoption at some point in my life. Mm -hmm. And then, interestingly enough, about six or eight months later, um, I found out that my mom was adopted. Um, and so at that point, it became um, part of my story. And I realized that my life was a direct result of the blessing of adoption and um, just the heritage that can come from that. And so at that point, I really felt like this was going to be more a part of my story in the future, but not yet. Yeah, and actually, Forsey plays a neat role in, in our adoption story because it was as we were here directing the day camp from 03 to 05, um, we were meeting so many different families, and including some Ethiopian families that began to have us over to their home, and, and the one mother had grown up working in an orphanage with her own mother, and just hearing some of the stories uh, of, you know, what God was doing through that and becoming burdened specifically um, for Ethiopia and gaining understanding about that. And that was one of the countries that was open to us in the adoption process. And so God just, you know, used all of that as part of our journey. So the abridged version. Yes, very much. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of people have inclinations to adopt when they hear stories um, about adoption. But and you, your hearts clearly were inclined in that direction. But what did God do to confirm to you that this was actually the path that you should follow? Yeah. So definitely there were some roadblocks that were kind of made us nervous, just, you know, uh, financially and just the um, trying to travel and different things um, and having three small children at the time when we were starting to think about this. But um, really seeking the counsel of others and Actually, again, here at 4C, as we met with some families who had adopted and had really inspired us in our time here, we came back um, and talked with the Bladicks and several other families. The Iries as well. The Iries, yep, and several others. And um, it was just such a confirmation to us as we saw the legacy these families had, and it really encouraged us. And, you know, they advised us the, the good, the bad, the ugly, um, but it was just really part of that process of feeling confirmation. It was great to see, for me to learn that it wasn't just up to us to do this on our own, that God had put this in the heart of many people, and even some that can't adopt personally, can help, can pray, and could certainly give to support uh, adoption, because that's a big 
you know, overwhelming thought at times. And, you know, even entire organizations are out there to help people with this that feel stuck and they feel like they want to. But, I um, mean, you know, like LifeSong is an organization that helped us with three of our adoptions. They work with churches to support family. And just some people aren't even aware there's so much support out there. It's, it's a whole work of the body, not just any one, one family that way. And then, you know, for me, I think about in terms of confirmation. Then there's just all those little things that only God can, can do. And so when we first got this picture here of Matthias, uh, this is the first picture we received the night he was referred to us. And we had long wanted to name him Matthias. It's a name that means gift of the Lord. Uh, we wanted him to know that it wasn't just our family was a gift to him, but that he is a, a gift to us. And uh, his name is, is Tegen Matewos. Matewos is his family name already in Amharic. And so he already had basically the name Matthias. And so sometimes God will make it, I guess, really obvious, you know, in that way. And, and that's part of how God confirmed things too. And then as we went and we met Matthias for the first time, mm. I think we have a picture of our trip. Um, he, he really didn't feel like that about us when we first got there. <laughs> Just don't be fooled. That was not our first glance. Um, but <laughs> uh, he just was this little boy that had a personality that was way bigger than him. Mm. And um, honestly, to fit into our family, you need to kind of be... Um, Loud. Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and so God knew. I mean, we saw a lot of really quiet, withdrawn, shy children going into families. And um, they were overwhelmed a little bit by um, our son, Matthias. And yet we were like, this is the perfect match for our family. This God knew this was us. Yeah. yeah. So. It's amazing how God uh, does those perfect matching things uh, when you follow what he wants along the road of adoption. Um, but God had something in mind for you more than just Matthias. So tell us about Abram. Sure. Um, so the interesting thing, and I, I, a lot of times when people hear that we've adopted a child with Down syndrome or, you know, just in general, a child with special needs, they think that we are, like, so wonderful, and, um, you know, all this, let me just tell you, <laughs> it was not our plan. This was not something that um, we ever aspired to do. It was not even a thought in our minds, but um, on our first trip to meet Matthias, we went to an orphanage that he had been in previously, um, and we were touring the orphanage, <clears throat> and we ended up in a room uh, with children with special needs. And I met this little girl in the picture, and um, it was there in that room that God began a work to gloriously ruin me, um, because he started working in my heart. And, and at the time, I said, God, I'll pray for her. I'll find her a family, even. I will do everything in my power, but not me, God. And, um, God and I was standing it. over, taking this picture, saying, this is not happening right now. <laughs> We need to get my wife out of this country right now um, because uh, we, you know. We, we haven't saw, even gotten Matthias home yet. We haven't gotten Matthias <laughs> home. We're there with Matthias. We're there with Matthias. And uh, I was afraid of what was happening in my wife's heart. That's all. So. But she just had this infectious laugh and smile and such joy. And God just started to do a work. And over the next 18 months, it um, really went from fighting him on, like, why would I do this, God? Don't, don't you know I have a full life and a busy family? And um, to the point where he got me to the, to the place where I was asking, why wouldn't I do this? You have um, done so much for me. And, you know, love reaches across the oceans and um, pays the cost. And, and so um, it became part of our journey. And, you know, that was great, but I still wasn't, that wasn't there. And then, so I was away for a class for a week, and I had the laptop that we had taken on this trips, these trips to Ethiopia. And I was supposed to be doing my work, but I started looking back through pictures from those trips, pictures like this one and more, and videos of this little girl. And I began to research Down syndrome, and I began to learn all about, you know, people with Down syndrome and the blessing, you know, that, that people are. And began to learn things like in most places over 90% of children, once they're screened and identified as having Down syndrome potentially, um, that, that abortions occur um, with that kind of a frequency. And, and I was just, you know, burdened about that. Came back, you know, began to talk with Meg about it. Said, you know, have you ever just Googled this little girl? And she was so mad because she, she was like, I'm serious. I really would like well, to know. Well, because at that point, the government had shut the orphanage down, and we couldn't find her, and we had been looking for her for almost a year. And so 
I did Google her and found pictures of her. Um, and it was crazy, but that's because a family had adopted her and begun to blog about her and tell her story. And so at first, I think we thought we were off the hook. Like, oh, great, she has a family. God, you're amazing. You even let us know. This is great. <laughs> and then I just felt like he kept putting his finger on it and saying, no, but what you are willing to do for her, be willing to do for another. And our hearts were ready at that point, you know, to move in that kind of a direction. And we had explored with several agencies, you know, are there children, you know, with Down syndrome in Ethiopia? And, and none of them had placed children you know, with Down syndrome. And just a few days later, uh, we learned about Abram, that he had recently come into an orphanage uh, through an agency That we had there. contacted with three days earlier. So <laughs> yeah. it was pretty amazing. Um, and upon seeing that little face, we knew um, that he was our son. And um, we were all in, and we just had such great joy and excitement in the Lord as we pursued him to bring him home. And, I mean, that's not that it was easy. There was yeah. some, some, some real journey, and uh, the closer we got at times, the, the more challenging it, it seemed, even meeting him, you know, for the first time and being pretty overwhelmed with, with some of the extent of his needs. I shared some of this in the message last week, but... Uh, you know, he, he was asleep when we first got there, and I was perfectly okay with that because I felt like our lives could continue as they were for a little bit longer. Uh, and then he woke up, but he woke up, but he really had no life as he woke up. And uh, and so you know, we were nervous, scared. Uh, but then there's a moment when um, Meg got him laughing, and you know, just laughing like humans laugh, you know. And, and in my mind, I just remember thinking, okay, we're going to be okay. And then looking back on that, I realized that, that that was the first time I included him in, in the we. You know, when I said we're going to be o okay, it wasn't, you know, we're going to be okay. He's going to do, you know, it was we together are, are going to be okay. Uh, this was becoming us. This was becoming our, our one family. And, and so that was, was kind of the day when um, God moved our hearts in that way. Okay. So I th we're going to take a little uh, break here. In the, in the interview, I just um, have a couple things that before uh, Mike and Meg have a song they want to share with us and continue with the interview, which we will continue with, I wanted to take a moment to, um, to share um, a few things. And we know that on Orphan Sunday, or often as sort of our tradition on Orphan Sunday, knowing God's heart for us, that we should share his heart, uh, that we offer a chance for you to respond as a congregation. Um, and uh, so uh, today, although we're talking primarily about adoption, did want to share an opportunity with you um, with uh, International Orphan Care. And some of you may know Jim and Barbara Pitts have been forcing missionaries for some 60 years, um, taking care of unwanted and orphaned children um, at the Children's Haven um, in what we'll just say is a Muslim country in North Africa. And uh, as they ease into retirement, uh, and start to draw on some of their retirement funds and prayerfully look for their replacements, they have told Forsey, you know, we don't need your support anymore as missionaries, but we would like you to, um, if possible, to, to help us out a little bit with the children's haven, with the children. And so Forsey has decided to provide him a gift in, uh, in response to that request. And we'd also like to um, invite you to uh, help them as well. In the bulletin, there's an insert there. One side has some scripture on God's heart for the orphan. The other side has a little more information about the pits and the uh, children's haven. And uh, at the bottom of that is some information about how you, you can share financially with them, uh, with the master's mission. Uh, you can do that in a variety of ways. Uh, some information is, the address is given there, but if you go online, you can see a number of different ways where you can do that. And uh, we ask that you not only pray for them, but also uh, prayerfully consider uh, providing a gift as well. Uh, apart from that, um, and I'm excited about this, the orphan ministry, we're sort of entering a new season, and um, although we've always, you know, we, our, our goal has always been to follow Hebrews 10, 24, where it says, let us consider how to stimulate each other to love and good works. And we know from Ephesians 2, 10, that God has preordained those, those works beforehand for us. So um, part of that, we... To, to move forward, we are looking for those of you who might be interested, who have a real heart for, uh, for orphan and vulnerable children, uh, to join our leadership team. And if you just let us know that, uh, I'll tell you how you can do that in just a second. And then also those of you who may not want that sort of a level of, 
of uh, commitment, but those who you are interested in, in working with us and um, after we have a chance to get together as a new team and pray and um, to, to come together to, to work with us in short-term projects, long-term projects, uh, ongoing work in the orphan ministry. Um, so what we'd like you to do is uh, you, there's a, a welcome card uh, that you all have that you know what that's for normally, but today we'd like you to, if you're interested in maybe learning about more adoption after today or uh, being part of the leadership team or just involved in the orphan ministry, that you put your name, contact information, and then uh, on the other side you write in uh, you know, what you would like to know or uh, you know, if you have an interest, and so we really appreciate that as well. Um, and so, um, or if, you know, you're not ready to do that today, think about it prayerfully. Um, our email address is in the bulletin today and in the directory, and you can catch us um, if you're interested in, in, in interest. And that's something that I uh, see really exciting things that we can do, and uh, the opportunities are, are uh, pretty endless uh, to work for God in that way. So, um, you can drop those cards in the, uh, in the offering, but before we go to offering, let me pray. Father, we thank you for Orphan Sunday and the chance every year to really focus on your heart for us and how you loved us so much that you actually adopted us into your family and um, all that that means, although sometimes we just don't get it, we don't understand, we forget, and we confess that we do forget because maybe we're not home yet, I don't know, or maybe just life is so hard sometimes and our hearts get hardened, and so Lord, we pray that you soften our hearts. We pray that you remind us about what it means to be adopted and, and uh, your love for us. Um, help us have your heart then toward the fatherless, just as you had for us. We know that not everyone is called to adopt children, um, but we are called to have your, uh, called to adopt your heart for uh, orphans and the vulnerable. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Um, so we be your hands and feet to do what you've called us to do. We pray, Lord, for orphans around the world and uh, vulnerable children. We pray for, pray for foster children in this country, for adoptive families and those who are called to adopt and haven't yet done that. We pray specifically for the Children's Haven and the Pitts Ministry there and for all those children, Lord, and their needs. We pray that all the financial gifts there not only give what they need, but, Lord, are a message and, and a sign to those around of your love um, in what could be a dark place. And we also pray for us at Forcey, Lord, and uh, individually um, and as an orphan ministry that uh, as your children, we hear your voice and we respond to minister in ways that you show to us. And as we take the offering today, Lord, we freely give to you when we offer this and say that, Lord, we ask that you bless it all to your service and especially to your glory. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this is a song that we actually wrote the, the night that we accepted Matthias's referral. Uh, I think if any parent, adoptive parent, or just anyone that's ever loved someone can relate to kind of the heart of this song, that God would just be there. We know God's everywhere, you know, like we know God was everywhere, but he was also there for Edna in that moment. <laughs> And it's a heart that we know God's everywhere. Be there and show up um, in the lives of, of those we love. And it's God's heart for us.
not done yet come back yeah <laughs> no you're not done yet because we have one more part of the story so Matthias and Abram come home but God had at least I'll say at least one more <sighs> to plan in your hearts so tell don't, us about Finn don't let them hear you say that <laughs> uh, so you know it was actually the first day that Meg was home technically by herself for 11 years because all five of their kids were now at school and it was that first day of school and most women would like nap or you know go for a walk or and instead Meg is looking at agencies online and learning the stories of children and so she came across um, a picture of our beautiful daughter Fen and you know is as I noticed she was doing this and, and began to, to look at specifically these pictures as well, um, you know, God was moving in my heart already, uh, seeing some others adopt older children, specifically older girls, knowing of some of the vulnerabilities uh, there with older, older girls in these situations. And so, you know, the one picture there is of a video actually where you know, she's singing and dancing, and that's... I mean, I could watch this a hundred times, but sorry. I think I gave a, a wrong cue there at some point. But that's another video. But at first we just saw these videos of her singing and dancing and just trying to get the attention of someone in the world. I mean, that's the whole purpose of that. And... Uh, and it just, it, it broke my heart. And so, you know, we kind of began to, to pray that way and uh, eventually decided to pursue her. <laughs> so um, unlike the other journeys we had because Fen was older and because of the organization we were working with, um, we knew some families that were traveling during the time that we were waiting for Fen. It was about a year. And we were able to send um, little things pictures, letters, a book that we made for her of our family, um, a necklace that had a picture of mom and dad on it, um, really to pursue uh, her heart during that time. And um, just like God pursues us, and he's constantly um, just wanting our attention. And so... 
Um, and God taught us how to pursue, and God yes. taught us how he pursued us. And um, so, you know, just fast forward, you know, we were there uh, in country, and, you know, having pursued in that way, just believing that God was preparing your heart, and uh, we do have this video of first meeting Fen, and it's a real blessing and a real picture, I believe, of God's love for us. So. And I had had a kind of just this vision, a, a dream, actually, that she was going to come and run to us and to our open arms and embrace us. And that's really not typical of how these, you know, first gotcha day moments happen. Um, often children are scared and afraid, but we really felt like God, had, you know, had prepared her heart. And as we had pursued her, and it was just such an absolutely beautiful picture of what God calls us to do, um, just to run to his arms and to trust him alone. Um, and she did that. She didn't, she didn't know what we were saying. She didn't know anything about us. Um, and she, from that moment on, just completely put her trust in us as her family. And um, it's just a beautiful picture you'll get to see. I know we're glad she's here. And so, you know, that video, I remember posting it up uh, that evening in China, which was morning here, and not expecting, you know, a, a ton. Uh, and then I woke up the next day and I had a, a voicemail from a local newspaper, from a local TV station, and I realized that video had been viewed by almost a couple hundred thousand times. <laughs> overnight and it just grew and grew from there and to me it was just um, evidence that the world is longing for this kind of love you know this kind of a love story they're longing for exactly what God is longing to give <laughs> to us um, the gospel and and to adopt us into his family even and so um, so that was powerful and then we always just have to say that as romantic and as beautiful as what that looks like I mean adoption is beauty and it is so much brokenness too and that has not been what life is always like at all. Um, there are some real, real, real trials um, that are also real blessings. But um, in, in fact, often when people ask us, you know, should, should we adopt, what do you think? And, and though we love to encourage, you know, people with eyes wide open to go on that journey, a lot of times say, well, wait a minute, I don't know if this is the best season or the best fit right now because you, you can't expect it to be this grand romantic experience that's going to fill some void in your heart. <laughs> you have to go secure, you know, in who you are in Christ. And, and especially if you and your spouse are not on the same page, you have to both be yeah. 100% all in because there will inevitably be difficult times when one of you is going to have to carry the load, and if you're not both in, it can make for a very messy situation. Yeah, and that was so key for us in that way, so we love sharing that as well. So um, so that's, you know, there's so much more we, we could share, but we want to share a song. It's called Beautiful. Um, it's written for Fen, and Tim, if you want to say anything else. Right just now. just thank you for sure. uh, for opening yourself up to, uh, to this and to sharing with us. And yeah. um, obviously there's a lot of the story here that couldn't be told and, and maybe we'll revisit it sometime, but we do. Um, if you have questions about adoption, um, you can bring them to Sue and I, or obviously Mike and Meg have a lot to say about it. So thanks. So this song, Beautiful, um, was penned right after we saw, we had committed to Fen. Um, and the interesting thing is that we, what we couldn't have known was that the 
one of the things that was so hard for her to accept and to believe about herself is that she is beautiful, um, that she is a beautiful creation of God and made in his image. Um, and so as we um, wrote in the song, I'll sing it until you believe that it's true. And I really also believe it's the heart of God for us that he's just going to keep telling us who we are until we believe that it's true. And so this is beautiful. You don't have to dance You don't have to sing You don't have to prove anything You don't have to spin You don't have to twirl You're already daddy Just come and be you. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. And all of you catches all of my eye, captures all of my heart. You're beautiful. I could be to get into heaven. I grew up on a farm in Ohio and I was going to church with my parents. But I trusted God and that's the important thing. You have to trust God. Until a very young age I lost my parents. That's when I was crying along the road in uh, Nigeria where I was born and God met me there right there. And my father saw that I was bored and leaned over and he says if you listen, you won't be so bored. So I listened. Drove by here on East Randolph Road and I saw the sign for Forsy. I said, you know what, I'm going there. And I was like, this is a place where we can raise a family. 
So we started this series last week. This is us. We're in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. And, you know, as you see those little frames there in the video, I know we think about our own little frames and, and the families and the people within them. And we, we've already said that you know, sometimes what we've envisioned uh, being in those frames and a part of those frames don't always happen as we've envisioned or as we've dreamed, that there's a, a real mix of beauty and brokenness in our experience and, and relationships in this world. And yet what we've already celebrated is that God has still determined to take one big frame and to put us all in it through Christ. That no matter our experience, that God is not ashamed to frame you as part of his family. And this series is all about recognizing that there's a big frame around us. And now, who are we? Not just in the small picture, but in the big picture of God's family. What is true about us? And part of that is that we, as God's family, have been adopted. Now, some of us in your own pictures uh, have evidence that you're from adoptive families or foster families or that you're close to, you know, adoption situations, foster situations. I know it's not just us. There's so many here um, that God is working through and blessing in that way. And would you just stand if that identifies you at all, just so we can celebrate the picture that you are of God's love and uh, your presence here in our in our church family. Let's just praise the Lord. That's a picture of some more up there. Um, Thank you. And again, it's just celebrating the picture, uh, celebrating the picture that you are of the relationship that God desires with each and every one of us to adopt us into his dear forever family. Now, we already looked last week at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, which says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And remember, we talked about how that blessing is not attached to circumstances, that the blessing is a category that God puts over us. It's a title that he puts over this category that he puts us in, that he says, you are blessed regardless of the circumstance of this world. If you're adopted into his family, that you experience all of the promises initially that he intended for creation, that initially he intended to carry on through, you know, Abraham and, and the promise of God as we trace it through Scripture, that those promises are ours through Christ, that we are never less than blessed. And now in the rest of this passage, he's going to give us three uh, ways that we're blessed through our identity in Christ. And the first we'll look at today, and that is that we are adopted. And we see it right in verse 4. It says this, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love, having predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, which he bestowed on us in the beloved. We're just going to unpack this, these verses here, verses 4 through 6. And I'm going to give you some points, and I'm just going to give them to you all up front, because the first one is that adoption is God's choice. Adoption is God's choice. As you think about how he's chosen us in him, I must say that sometimes I think the impact that God wants us to feel from this passage can get lost in some debates about some of the finer points of theology (laughs) that that we like to have. And and I just want to point out that as I see this, you know, and as I think about what Paul's thinking as he's writing it and what they're thinking as they receive this letter, they're not thinking in terms of their personal salvation as individuals. And to what extent that you know, happens through the sovereignty of God and their free will and all those things that sometimes we think about. Th- this book of Ephesians is primarily written to address the big picture. <laughs> it's written to address the big family, not the mystery of our own individual salvation, but the mystery that God was beginning to reveal that it was his purpose to unite all people in Christ. People from every people group were intended to be united in Christ. And, and this is all about... His intention and purpose, which was new to them as they were understanding it, to bring everyone together under Christ. That's what verses 9 and 10 say. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment. Those times, as far as they were concerned, were happening. To bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. The book of Ephesians is all about God's ultimate plan to bring salvation to everyone, not just the Jews as they had been thinking for so long. 
And so we see in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, the mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Again, that was new for people outside of, you know, the, the relationship that the Jews had with the Lord to think in terms of that way. In fact, even Paul in Romans chapter 9, verse 4 He's talking about his heart for Israel, that if anyone should know Jesus, it should be Israel. And he, he, he says for them, because theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple, the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the ancestry of the Messiah. That, that all these things were, were first theirs. But now as Paul's revealing to the Ephesians that there's something new that's being revealed that that what was theirs and, and thought of as theirs is now for all. And, and it always was. It's just God is now revealing it in kind of a new way of emphasis and a new way of doing it and bringing all people together in one body into his church. And, and so Ephesians 2, verse 11, remember, he says to them, that you were formerly Gentiles by birth. Remember that at time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenant of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, you who were once far away have been brought near. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Do you hear that? They have to get used to the idea that they're just as included as anyone ever. That they're just as chosen as anyone ever. And that's what 1 Peter 2 says. You are a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people belonging to God. They may declare his praise. And so what I, what I see here in Ephesians is that through Jesus Christ, that, that God has intended for all of us, he is a he is intended for all of us to share fully in his promises, to be grafted into the promises that he had made to his people Israel, and to share fully in everything and every blessing he's intended for anyone that's been ever called his people, that we get to be his people through Christ, that we are chosen, that he is determined that his heart is to adopt everyone into his family. And there's something different that happens when you know that you're chosen. That God's heart is for you. Fen was the 17th one into her orphanage on day one of her life. Into her specific orphanage. And before we had connected with her, she had seen 500 other children adopted that had come in and out of her orphanage. Kids come in, the families come, they adopt, they go out. Some would even come back and visit. Why not her? Now you can understand how God is preparing your heart, that she'd be ready to run into the arms of her parents who had chosen her. How good it is to be chosen by God. I believe that God's revealing that his intention is to choose not just any one people group, but everyone who through faith in Christ would come to him. There's a cost, though. And we see that here. As soon as he says, in love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, and he goes on and talks about redemption through his blood, we know what this means, that just as parents will invest a lot you know, of all kinds of resources, there's a great cost, you know, in the adoption process that Jesus Christ has paid a great cost to secure our adoption, to give us a way to be adopted into God's forever family. And it's that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, that he gave up his very life for us. That's, that's how valuable we were to him, the price of his life laid down for us. And that always encouraged Meg and I when, when you know, things were getting hard in adoption, that this is what Jesus gave for us, I think, think this is doable. That while we were still sins, he died for us and rose again, proven to be God. And that his cost was acceptable, the price he paid was acceptable before God for us to be made holy and blameless through faith in Jesus Christ. 
I also see that this is God's heart. I see, as it says in verse 5, predestined us for adoption in accordance with his pleasure and will. When we think of that idea of, of God's heart, we think of his heart and his purpose for us and also his pleasure in us. And that's what this word here means, this word pleasure. It's this purposeful pleasure that God has for us. And like Meg said, that can be hard for people to wrap their minds around, that God would take pleasure in me, that God would delight in me. Sometimes we run from that because we feel unworthy, but this is God's delight, is to adopt people from all backgrounds, in all places, and to adopt them into his family, that he takes joy and pleasure in it, that this is his heart. And it's his heart for us who he's determined to bring into his family. I believe he's pursuing us and singing over us until we believe that it's true. If you're here and you're not even secure of that relationship with Christ, it's because God's pursuing you. He's pursuing you. He's got a plan for you. He's trying to show his delight in you. Beyond that, I see that adoption is God's grace. And grace just means we couldn't do nothing. <laughs> that he had to do everything. And that's, that's verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one that he loves. That God wants to be famous for his grace, and he shows that in the way that he adopts us into his family because we are separate and excluded from him, and there is nothing that we can do. We are dead in our sins, Ephesians will go on to say. But because of his great love for us, he's given grace to us. That though we are unworthy, through Christ, he brings us into his family because of his love for us anyway. And, and that's true, of course. Adoption is that picture. I mean, you know, honestly, when, you know, someone is without a family, it takes someone to, to have a heart for that person and, and to give to that person, even though they haven't received anything yet from that person, right, and to adopt them into their family. That's just the reality. And God says that's the reality of our situation is we had nothing to bring to the table. There was no song we could sing. There was no dance we could do. God from eternity past had already been caught in his eyes for us and captured in his heart for us and been determined to give grace in this way. And the one, one thing we do have to do is receive it. And that's the last thing I see here in this idea of adoption is presumed that one is going to receive what God gives, to receive the grace and the invitation into the family. And that's what is said of Jesus in John 1, 12, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. He, he was about to do all the work. And all that would be left is for us to receive him. You know, in Fen's case, because she was an older child, as we had come to China with our uh, three of our children, we had done all the work for months, and, you know, everything was done, and yet we still, at a moment, had to go to the embassy there, and having done all that and been that far along in process, this 11-year-old girl was asked again if she wanted to be adopted, and had to sign what she could of her name on a piece of paper. And if in that moment she was unwilling to do that, everything was off. And I praise God that she did. But I am grieved that in God's pursuit of us and of you, having done everything necessary to secure your place in his family, having put the papers on the table, that some are tempted, as she could have been in that moment, to feel unworthy. That some are tempted, as she could have been in that moment, to be scared for whatever reason. And don't receive what God has made possible through Christ. And church, I'm telling you, the word of God is so clear. To all who receive him, to those who believe and place trust in his work for them, we are adopted into his family. but it does take that step of faith to receive. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes.
with all heads bowed, all eyes closed. Maybe you're here and you're, you're not sure if you have a secure place in God's family. Maybe you haven't heard it this way. Maybe you've been trying to come up with efforts or religious efforts even that, that, that somehow are going to catch God's eye or impress him. And you've heard today, though, that it takes the work of Christ out of the grace of God and his love for you. And today, I encourage you, if you have not yet received salvation through Jesus Christ, the place in God's forever family, why not today? Choose in your heart, even today, to trust Jesus for what he's done for you. And to take that step. And if that is your heart today, just... I invite you to tell him right now in the quietness of your heart. And, and I'll even give you some words to express. You could just say to him right now in your heart, just if this is your heart, just say to him this, Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and am unworthy. But I believe that you died for my sin and for my shame. And I believe that you rose again and I am trusting in you alone to forgive my sin, to give me eternal life, to restore my place in your family. If you're here today, and the best you know how you've, you've expressed that, you can know that God's word is so clear that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, that nothing will ever separate us from his love, that we are forever secure with a place the table in his family. And I want to give you the opportunity just to set that mark before God and and even before me this morning to say, yes, that is my heart. Best I know how I'm I'm choosing to trust in Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's been your heart and your prayer, would you just slip up your hand right now and set that mark that I could see it? Anyone? Yes, God bless you. And you and you. Anyone else that would say, yes, I want to secure my place in God's family today? God bless you guys. Father, I thank you that we can call you Father through Jesus. That you have pursued us and loved us and proven your love for us through the work you've done for us to make it possible for us to be with you. And Lord, for those who have called on you today, would you just help them to know that your promises are sure. Grow them in their walk with you. Bless them. For all of us, Lord, may it make a difference to live knowing that Lord, you have adopted us. That you have seen us and not passed us by. That you have chosen and determined to place us into your family. Lord, may it make a difference. We are not who we once were. We share in all the promises. We gather around your table. 